speaking of Hanuman, discusses the many faces of the monkey god, uh, Arshia in conversation with Namita and Dashakarmaura. Arshia's adventures with Hanuman is the latest testament to the late, uh, lasting appeal of Hanuman. And we know Namita, she's a writer, publisher, and the co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival oh, and Mountain Echoes. And uh, we have Dashukar Mora, the director of Center for Bhutan Studies, who earned his undergrad degree at Oxford University and his master's in philosophy of economics from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he was bestowed the honor of Drogkorlo Wheel of Dragon Kingdom by His Majesty for his contribution for literature and fine arts. And Dasha will talk about the creation myth with baboons. This is pretty interesting. Uh, monkey in astrology, monkeys in the holy bi biographies, and monkeys in arts and theatre. friends, can you hear me? I have to say that today's session is the dearest and closest to my heart of many that have been held in this or other festivals. And I'm fortunate to have two very, very dear friends who I respect and revere here on the stage with me. It was just six days ago, last Saturday, that Arshi and I were sitting in the South Bank Centre in London for the day of the Jaipur festival, where she and I did a session on myth and memory with other people. And here we are, all the way to the Himalayas, to discuss myth again in a new context. Uh, she's already introduced both Dasha Karma, Ula, and Arshia, but uh, Arshia is a Hanuman Bhakt like me. She has a special reverence for the monkey god. And uh, indeed, uh, Hanuman has guided me through some of the most difficult periods of my life with his pragmatism, his energy, and his hope. And as Karma, Dasha Karma Ura will tell us, his compassion. Um, yesterday, a little late in the day, it struck me that I had not done my homework properly, and we were talking about Hanuman from India, but what about Hanuman in the Himalayas? So I run up my source of knowledge and uh, my, uh, what do you say, human Google. And uh, he told me that, uh, about Avalokiteshwar and the compassionate monkey god in the Himalayas. And what we will learn today is something new which many of us may not have learned before and known before. So thank you very much, both of you. We will begin with a short little looped invocation to Hanuman uh, to get the blessings first. Nena? Could we begin? Guru so honored to be on the same panel uh, with Sir. Uh, 
Because uh, one of my obsessions also with Hanuman has been how does Hanuman appear in um, cultures outside of the dominant Hindu culture in, in, in the subcontinent or in India, certainly. Um, and I, um, I did very, very little bit of work on um, Hanuma, uh, monkeys as they appear in the Buddhist Jatakas, for example. And also for me, what became very exciting was the Chinese monkey in Journey to the West. Uh, who is a marvelous, marvelous character. But anyway, that's for the second part of, of this um, session. I want, you know, people say, how did you find Hanuman? I didn't find Hanuman. He came and got me, I mean, really and truly. If you ask my mother, uh, oh, you know, how come your daughter's so interested in Hanuman? Um, she'll say, oh, it's, you know, she was bitten by a monkey when she was three years old. Which the is con true. If I could explain, the context there, of course, is that Arshia, is Muslim by faith, but still she is a Hanuman Bhakt by conviction as well. I was born into a Muslim family, so people find it strange that I should have such an attachment to the Ramayana and to Hanuman in particular. So my mother is very clear. It's very simple. Uh, which is a lovely, simple explanation. And I never thought about that particularly. Uh, I just thought, you know, you fall down when you're a child, you have some injury, fine. Um, but then uh, uh, I was doing my master's in, in, um, in the US. And as part of it, I, I just started to work on Hanuman at that time. And um, I needed uh, to translate, to complete my master's uh, thesis, I needed to translate the Hanuman Chalisa. And I couldn't find one. This is the 1980s, this is the dark last century, you know. Everything was not on the internet. So there was one copy, uh, fortunately for me, I was studying in Washington, D.C. And there was one copy in the Great Library of Congress. So, you know, I'd go there every day and I'd read it. But when you're translating something, you can't have it in the library. You have to, it has to be with you. You know, you have to put it under your pillow when you go to sleep. You have to hold it. You have to, you know, you have to own it. It can't be this dried up, well, I'll go and for three hours I will translate in this beautiful building. So anyway, I was sort of trudging along, blah, blah. And one day I was walking to school and there was a, um, an Indian couple on the other side of the street. And, uh, you know, I was 22 or 23 or something. And I was like, you know, I don't talk to other Indians in America. I have not come here to talk to Indians. So I typically avoided my countrymen. But something, I crossed the street and I said, no, I stay auntie, no, I stay uncle, small talk. I said, ha, beta, how are you? Um, I said, oh, I'm studying, blah, blah. And then the lady said to me, she said, are you worried about something? So I said, not really, but uh, I have this thing on my mind. I'm trying to find a copy of the Hanuman Chalisa. And she said, beta, it's in my bag. And she took it out and gave it to me. And I was like, what is this? She said, well, it's Tuesday. It's Hanuman's day. Of course, you're going to find the Hanuman Chalisa. And I said, but you know, I need to keep. She said, it's yours. It's yours. Just take it. Um, and I never saw them again. I don't know if they were real or whether Hanuman appeared in their form, uh, you know, to cement his relationship with me, to make sure that I never thought about, you know, giving that same devotion to anybody else. I think he's a very possessive um, monkey. Uh, so, you know, through my life, he just shows up. And I, every time I think, uh, what's the big deal? Boom, I got a slap across my face. Like, here I am, don't you forget it. Um, I finished translating Ramayana in 1996. Uh, again, it was the last century. So there really was a thing like a manuscript, you know. Um, it's a huge, like, chunk of paper. And I was getting ready to send it off to Penguin, and I called the courier, and the courier was going to come and get it. And I was in the kitchen. We lived in the middle of Bangalore, in an apartment in the middle of the city. Um, and I'm in the kitchen, and I'm doing whatever, I don't know. And I hear my shouting uh, and I was like, oh my God, something has happened. You know, he's hurt himself or something. And I can't, and it's twilight time. Um, and I, I come out uh, and the, the manuscript is on the dining table and next to the manuscript is this enormous monkey. Huge, I mean like this big, right? And the monkey just touches the manuscript like that and just turns around and no hurry, no panic, <laughs> walks through the house and exits from the back veranda, right? And Sanjay, my husband and I were just like, 
Did you see that? Was there really a monkey in the house? And there was a monkey in the house, and he had just come to say, thank you. Just remember, this is my book, Ramayana. Yeah, whatever else you think, this is my story. Um, so I want to read a little bit. Uh, I've just done a new book. It's called Adventures with Hanuman, and it's for younger readers. And you know, the thing is that how do you tell the Hanuman story again? Everybody knows it, right? Uh, how do you also, in some way, acknowledge um, the presence of magic in your own life? Uh, the possibility for um, wonder. Um, and, you know, it, it's not only children who experience wonder. I mean, I wish that everyone in this room always has the capacity to feel wonder. So this is a story about a little boy who wakes up one night and finds Hanuman sitting on his bed. And um, Hanuman says, is it you? And Hanuman is like, yeah, it's me. So he says, Hanuman says to him, now, how can we bring some excitement into your ordinary life? What would you like to do? Where would you like to go? Who would you like to be? I want to be like you. I want to do all the things that you do. I want to be able to fly through the skies. I want to be able to grow bigger or smaller as I please. I want to be able to speak many languages. I want to fight Rakshasas. I want to carry mountains across the seas, Ravu said, bouncing up and down on his bed, trying to keep his voice to a whisper. Hey, 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 steady, said Hanuman with a smile. Smile, you can't do the things I do. You're a 12-year-old boy. And I, I am a wonderfully magical, supremely powerful super monkey. My father is Vayu, the wind god, without whom no living being can breathe. And my mother is Anjana, a shape-changing Apsara. The mighty Pandava Bhima is my brother. I have been blessed by the gods and the sages. I threatened the sun once, and I could capture the moon if I wanted, bragged Hanuman, thumping his white chest with his furry fists. Well, then, what can I do, said Raghu, dejected. What's the point of his being here if I can't fly and fly, fight with the Rakshasas, he thought. You can come with me and ride on my back while I do all these things, Hanuman offered, seeing how disappointed his new friend was. But you've already done them, said Raghu. The Ramayana is over. Sita has been found. Ravana has been defeated. Rama has come home to his kingdom. What's left to do? Ah, that's not quite true, said the monkey. The Ramayana is never over. It's always happening. At any given time, someone somewhere in the world is telling the story of Rama. Of course, they're also telling my story, he laughed, and mine's the better story. Look at all the things I did. I flew through the air. I killed Rakshasas and Rakshasis. I set fire to Lanka. Yes, yes, I know all that. Raghu interrupted hastily, worried the monkey would start boasting about his exploits again. As I was saying, the Ramayana is always happening, so I have to be around all the time. I mean, how would it all work out if it wasn't for me? Who would find Sita? Who would set fire to Lanka? Who would bring back the magic Sanjeevani and the Dronagiri mountain with it to save Lakshmana? Raghu rolled his eyes. Here's what I can offer you, said Hanuman. I have to go soon to where someone is telling the Ramayana. I can hear it now. They've come to the part where Rama and Lakshmana are coming towards Kishkinda. My part in the story is about to begin. Do you want to come with me? Right now, Raghu blinked. Right now, replied Hanuman, getting off the bed and swishing his tail around. Come on, climb onto my back. And so the little boy enters the Ramayana. On that note, could you tell us about the monkey god in the Himalayas? Uh, <coughs> first of all, uh, Namita's kind but very distressed invitation to me yesterday brought me here. I had no plan whatsoever. Uh, and, uh, Unlike um, Madam, I also have no specialist knowledge on monkeys uh, or divine monkeys. Uh, monkey, 
do make Bhutanese stock a lot these days uh, because of their theft of crops. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are very uh, interesting sayings about monkey, analogies of monkey applied to human beings. It's also used widely in Proverbs in Bhutan. Uh, one example is Chama de Toza, Chakala Doho. The the golden langurs uh, eat the crop, but the stone thrown by farmers fall on the white langurs because they are not so. Uh, the, the, the red uh, golden langurs uh, make away quickly, and the scapegoat uh, becomes the white langurs. Another saying uh, uh, is uh, applied to selfish people who appear now much more frequently in commercial part of town. Water doesn't leak from the hands of the monkeys. It's so tight fisted. <laughs> uh, I, I, but uh, I, I think uh, Namita sh should not have found uh, difficulty in finding goodness who can talk about primates. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm here, and when I was thinking about primates and mythology this morning, uh, actually, I found that uh, there are not uh, much sources in uh, Bhutanese literature. A lot is there in Tibetan literature, in a sense, and so we are influenced by that. So I think in the course of this morning's discussion, we will talk about uh, primates of baboons, uh, monkeys, langurs, uh, in Bhutanese arts and theatres, in holy biographies, in, uh, in creation myth, etc. So I don't know where to <laughs> I have 15 minutes, okay. Uh, okay, yeah. I, I think the... <coughs> the first... I, I think the first is... Mm, first is, I think, the... the, the, the uh, monkeys in astrology, which I don't understand fully, uh, but I can uh, give you some information, and that uh, the lunar calendars, or the Tibetan calendars, Putinese calendars, uh, um, divided since 1024, when it first began, into 60-year cycles. 60 years is broken up into 12 years, 12 years, 12, 12 uh, years each, and 12 years into 12 months, and so on down to the uh, daily 24 hours. And uh, certain uh, uh, parts of the day, uh, uh, at the shortest level, to the longest ones, are uh, dominated by signs and symbols of horoscopic animals, among which uh, monkey is one. one. So it seems that uh, from uh, uh, two to four is the hour of the monkey every day. Uh, every day, every day. And uh, in certain uh, uh, methods of uh, counting the lunar days, uh, 13 and 7th and 9th are the monkey days. Uh, in the 12 months in a year, the 5th month, this is 3rd month, in the, uh, uh, month. Uh, the 5th month is the lunar month, no, the, the monkey month. And uh, amongst the holy, in the holy biography of Guru Bush, for example, which we celebrate with virtuous behavior on 10th of the 5th, Tenth of the fifth lunar month is the birthday of Guru Nanak. Uh, so I think uh, uh, from this you can deduce the fifth month of the monkey month is, is uh, considered uh, slightly holy than the rest. Uh, in um, in the uh, uh, holy biography of Buddha, uh, typified by twelve turning points in his life, starting from his uh, conception, divine conception, to his parinirvana. Uh, one of them is uh, an incident that takes place between the uh, monkey and the Buddha at the town of Magadha, when the monkey offers honey to the Buddha. Uh, why that is uh, 
considered a turning point is uh, something still to be uh, analyzed seriously. I have not found it actually. Uh, 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 in the uh, arts and theater, I am sure you come across the four friends uh, sort of suggesting it's a mass communication on harmony. Uh, interesting thing is that amongst the four creatures, it is not human beings, but the monkey who is represented. Uh, I think roughly arranged in order of ecological footprint, elephant, <coughs> monkey, rabbit, bird. And it, uh, in some mythological account, the monkey is uh, said to be the incarnation, previous incarnation of Kinga or cousin of Buddha. Uh, in theater, um, in the dance of the Day of Judgment, uh, which is an essential component in the festival of Zimbabwe, uh, the monkey takes a very crucial and sensitive role in judging the uh, ethical outcomes of human beings while they are on this earth. <laughs> uh, why this road falls on the monkey is still a mystery to me, but you know, he is the one who is given the task of weighing the karmic consequences of the actions of human beings. Others are there to capture, torture, or <laughs> do uh, something else, but the monkey has this uh, discriminating uh, role. A very interesting, uh, very interesting one. Uh, but the main story I want to uh, retell just now is uh, the creation myth uh, in which monkey is central in this part of the world. Uh, and it is a Tibetan uh, mythology, uh, but taken almost as a historical narrative, not a myth. Uh, that was put down uh, in writing in the 6th century. Uh, in Sonsen Campus time. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, reference to the creation myth, uh, I, as I said, is almost taken as a history, not as a myth. And I want to, since it's a literally, a literary event, I want to quote one uh, modern historic, Tibetan historian, who had a poetic gift, and he starts his writing like this. I bow in respect to the body mind of speech to the lotus feet of ancient historians who have penned well with understanding the rainbow arc of the past. And in this rainbow arc of the past, this, uh, this, this account uh, of uh, is uh, crucial. This is what I want you to tell uh, in, in, in a sort of, uh, compressed form. Uh, in this story, Himalayan landform, sorry, uh, Himalayan landforms emerged from the depth of ocean as the ocean dries up. And this is account also consistent with geological information as you know. And this uh, uh, raising of the landmass uh, finally leads to emergence of vegetation and animals uh, in this part of the world. Uh, the, uh, crucial to this story is the emergence of baboons amongst the animals. Uh, in a certain place called Nak Chasoche, there is a, a forest with, blessed with 100 edibles or so, uh, roughly translated. And this is now identified as Zayul, uh, somewhere in Xinjiang, I, I suppose, in, in the second glacial period. Uh, now, the baboons flourish in this uh, wonderful, wondrous landscape uh, uh, with delicious edibles, with the dazzling sunlight of the Himalayas, uh, with some girdled and surrounded by snow mountains. Uh, what a way to live for baboons. Uh, they initially depend uh, on uh, fruit trees, but as they multiply from first six to four hundred and four hundred, on and on in June, exponential way, a conflict arises. A conflict leads them to split into two groups. Those who depend on 
tree top troops and those who depend on bush tree troops. Uh, and as the struggle for food intensified, the baboons split yet again into four groups. And they disperse and migrate as far as China, India, according to this story. But one group becomes the progenitors of the Tibetan race. Uh, in course of time, they are struck with the idea of cultivating <coughs> food when they repeatedly observe that the falling seeds germinate. And when they start eating, before that they used to eat mamibi and so sort of food that was not cultivated. We still do, we still do, and that is the idea of a paradise of children where we can enjoy uncultivated, unplanted uh, food without human labor. But now they start cultivating, and uh, there's the time they shed gradually uh, furs from their body, and they become more humanite like according to this story. Ultimately, of course, they get a cereal, five cereal seeds from Mount Meru, which is associated with Kailash. But this is how uh, uh, the story uh, in Jesus. This is a lot of uh, embellishment details, etc. But the interesting question is uh, who was the first baboon? The first baboon. The first baboon was a Bodhisattva baboon. <laughs> uh, 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 and in this story, uh, he, the first baboon is materialized, is a projection. God of mercy and compassion, Karuna, <coughs> our located Swara. He initially assigned in a cave to meditate in austerity, in uh, celibacy. But uh, the interest uh, story gets excited. Uh, the, 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 the Bodhisattva Baboon uh, is approached with design for seduction by. <laughs> By rock being, female rock being, to say. Uh, no, but I think it's not demon, actually. It's not demon. We're still not very clear what this uh, uh, term means. And the uh, Bodhisattva Baboon then refers to Avalak Teshwara. Uh, he should uh, he should consort with the rock being. And uh, the, this is uh, approved, uh, uh, our location approves of this un union between these uh, two uh, beings. And that is how the, 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 the descendants of uh, Baboon start. <laughs> now, the, in this story, the, the Bodhisattva of Baboon is said to be. As I said, it's a emanation or projection of Avalokiteshvara Russia himself. And the female rock being is said to be expression or emanation of Para, the consort of Avalokiteshvara. Uh, so, 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 uh, so, uh, so, so, this the, the Tibetan race is a product. Of our located Shora and Tara, uh, and hence the Teragama uh, is the combination of our located uh, himself. You know, so, that, uh, so uh, what to make of this uh, is an interesting thing. Really. Does it suggest uh, what government should be, what political leader should be, uh, what Mr. Modi should be, <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> yes. should be, etc.? Anyway, I'll stop here. No, what I'd love to, um, it has been so fascinating to learn all these new thoughts for me at least. And uh, I'd like to know from both of you where Hanuman and the monkey race in India, where they would fit into the the genealogy, the mythology of this. Uh, could you tell us, Ashya, or could you suggest where Hanuman fits into this story? 
Well, um, the further east you go in India, by the time you reach Bengal, and the Ramayana story is being told over and over again, uh, the big change is in Hanuman because he stops being a brahmachari, he stops being celibate, and he becomes a, a very, very sexually active being. Mm -hmm. And he has, you know, children. The, a fish swallows a drop of his sweat, and even his sweat is so potent that you know she she produces a, a matsya Hanuman. And the further east you go, Hanuman becomes um, uh, responsible for for progen uh, for progeny, really. Uh, and then if, uh, the, the track that I can see is that, and then by the time we read China, mm -hmm. and he comes back as the great white ape in mm -hmm. Journey to the West, he is celibate again. But in between the east of India and the west of China, he uh, he's um, seen very much as, as an ancestor. Uh, of, I don't know if it's Hanuman, but certainly a Hanuman kind of monkey is responsible for who we are, which of course gets very exciting to um, scientists because they oh, we knew about evolution well before the West did. I don't think that's the point at all. But I do think that there's something very compelling about the figure of the monkey because they're so anthropomorphic. They are so much like us. And when we see them, we say, oh my God, there but for the grace of God go I, literally. Uh, so that, that would be my response. Any thoughts on this? Oh, well, I think uh, comparison and par par parallelism, etc., can always drop, uh, try, try, but it might become a bit strange, uh, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, all these stories, to me, suggest, uh, suggest. Uh, I think you, you, you were the ones who. On telephone told me about Jung, really, and uh, it uh, suggests to me the sharing of collective consciousness as opposed to personal or individual consciousness. Uh, collective consciousness is essentially about a pattern of thinking and behavior a long, long way back in the past, which is really influences us, uh, and in which uh, all sort of evolutionary stories are encoded, I suppose. Um, 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 but as uh, you said, uh, I think the, the, the uh, society and organization and the skills of monkeys and the takeoff of human beings must have a great deal of shared and deep points, still highly shared, as you said, uh, the level of intelligence, the structure of our Bodies, bodies, uh, looking forward, the eyes looking forward, the dexterous hand we share, uh, um, and some sort of uh, dominating social organizations, etc. Uh, uh, but um, I was noting down that you mentioned Hanuman's mother as an Apsara, mm -hmm. so, uh, 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 extraordinary uh, Dakini like figure which also publishes a lot of other myths in this uh, country. Uh, if I am not, uh, if I remember correctly, I also um, read somewhere that Hanuman spent some time, according to the story in Himalayas, writing actually Ramayana. <laughs> But because he was a monkey, he thought, oh, this is not good enough, and he sat up on, on top of a hill, and he threw it down page by page by page, and so it was all destroyed except for the last book, which became um, Hanuman Nataka, which is about, uh, you know, building the, the bridge, and uh, in which he says, you know, I don't know about this Valmiki, you know, I'm telling the real story, but what to do, I'm just a monkey, and nobody believes me. And so it's it's wonderfully self-referential. I mean, it's, you know, post-modern, post-everything, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, in Patna just now where they also told me about the Anand Ramayan, which uh, we won't go into just now. But uh, I was wondering, since this is a conversation which has been so compelling, whether we have time to take two questions. Yeah, we have our two questions, three questions. So very quickly, one, two, three in that order. Uh, first, Ashok Vajpayee, then. Information. One of the grammars which was lost is 
supposed to be the Hanuman grammar. And if you remember Octavio Paz's book, the monkey grammarian refers to this last grammar supposed to have been written by Hanuman. Because he learned grammar from Surya. That yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other, on a lighter note, we had Manohar Shyam Joshi, who wrote a long poem uh, using Bambaya Hindi. And one of the couplets in the poem, making fun, is Ham logo ka asal cheez atma ka andar hai, kaun sala bola tumko Hanuman ji bandar hai? <laughs> okay, next, Pratham. I just want to comment on the relationship between literary creation and um, historical narratives, and especially the role of monkey. Um, we know that the myth of, or the story of the divine monkey from the Tibetan Buddhist side comes from this literature called Manikapu more recently, which surfaced effectively only in the 13th century, I think. And then Hanuman comes from Valmiki's Ramayana, and the Chinese monkey comes from another literary source. But even if they are topics of literary creations, I don't know if we can totally discount the historical relevance in that I am I have more faith in human memory. And I think there must be some evolutionary relevance or evolutionary um, the re residues of past memories that have come down through ages, of course been embellished and exaggerated, but if it does actually hint to our sort of local understanding of evolution, especially when we go back to the Tibetan uh, myth of origin, the concept of the sea really is a memory of the Tethys Sea, whatever was left of the Tethys Sea in human memory. So even perhaps the monkey figure is a residue of memory of the evolution. So we cannot fully discount that. May I just respond to that in a sentence? I, I think you're absolutely right to remind us that um, uh, you know that memory does play a part in the way we see ourselves, not simply as individuals, but as uh, societies and cultures. But I think it's precisely memory plus imagination that creates literature, as uh, Vajpayee was saying earlier in the morning. So to never let, um, never uh, underestimate the. Power power of technology, never underestimate the power of imagination in our constructions of ourselves and the sort of uh, the, the enhancement of a historical narrative by literature, again as Vajpayee was saying in the morning. Uh, I think, yeah, the, the, he had already put up his hand earlier, Siddharthi. I'm going in the order the hands came up. I just wanted to ask you, you know, in, in mythology, as far as I'm... Uh, Aware, it keeps evolving. People keep adding bits and pieces to it over generations. And then suddenly, it seems to come to a stop, and whatever is there becomes the accepted version. Now, many of the things, uh, not only the accepted version, but the accepted theology of the day. Now, for instance, uh, the explorations that I've heard actually for the first time in my life uh, in that way. Suppose they were to be exposed and extolled across the country. Uh, would our understanding of each other, of human being, not expand hugely? And will it not come into direct contact with, uh, with the powers that are going to be from 26 onwards? Okay. And, and one, one more other question, that, uh, which is which is lighthearted being. Uh, everybody in Delhi, at least, keeps feeding monkeys all the time. And they populated. Uh, there, there are more monkeys in, in uh, the you know uh, the government buildings than, than bureaucrats. I don't know which are more useful. But what can be done about that? Well, that we've got exactly one minute left, so I'll quickly give my take, and maybe Arshia will. And uh, both Arshia and I, in our different ways, have been working on mythology. We did In Search of Sita, she's done so much work because we are, in India, mythology is never static, the gods are alive. And as long as the gods are alive and it is not static, we can keep reinterpreting it in a liberal, progressive, real way. The minute mythology becomes closed, 
A society is in danger. This is exactly what we discussed in the last session some time ago. And so I agree with you, these stories have to be told and retold, interpreted and reinterpreted. And I think we are through now. I can see people looking kindly at their watches. And the conversation can continue over tea, over the, the two people who still have their hands up. Just one piece of scientific information. A Chinese uh, did find a fossil of uh, mammals in Tibet only last year. So, uh, yes, uh, 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 I, I also agree with uh, Namita. I think uh, the uh, fossilization of things like this uh, starts when we believe too much in text. <laughs> That's the lesson of the festival, believe in imagination, not in text. A clap for that. Thank you.